Welcome to the Leader's Journey Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Gunn. Today I have with me Daniel Grove. Daniel, welcome to the show. Hi, so glad to be here. Yeah, I've been looking forward to getting you on the on the air with me for a while now. For those that don't know, Daniel is a master creative extraordinaire uh, <laughs> expert. He rules that universe well. Um, and and uh, we know that's true in my family because if you've uh, followed my family on Facebook very long, <laughs> you know that uh, we do interesting Christmas cards, <laughs> themed Christmas cards. And Daniel is the man that makes the magic happen. Uh, if you saw the photo shoot, you wouldn't be that impressed. But once Daniel's done with it, uh, we we get compliments all the time about our Hollywood style photos. So <laughs> that's all thanks to you, Daniel. My pleasure. <laughs> How'd you end up in the creative field? Have, have you known since you were a kid that was an interest or? Yeah, my whole family is very creative. I have two older brothers and we're all drawing artists, all nerds. My mom is a designer type of artist. My dad is kind of the, the three-dimensional type designer artist. So it's just in our genes and we can't get away from it. <laughs> so I've always been a creative artist in various like media, you know, Legos, drawing, 3D graphics, video editing, and discover photography in high school. So it's always been in there somehow and just find different ways to express it. Did you have any particular mentors, you know, as you've grown up either in the creative world or you're also active in your church and have been as mm -hmm. long as I've known you, uh, you're also active in business. Uh, so any mentors along the way? I didn't have as many as I wish I should have had that, that that's, I know I should have had, I, I had very few early on and I wasted a lot of years learning stuff the hard way. You never forget those lessons, but at the same time, you waste a lot of time. <laughs> so, uh, I calculated at one point, it took me about eight years to get good at photography, like to get my portraits where I knew what was going to happen when I pressed the button and I knew how to improve that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because I didn't have anyone helping me. I did have someone take a risk on me early on and they let me borrow their professional equipment to do a wedding. I already had my own stuff, but he had like mm -hmm. way better stuff. And he mm -hmm. let me use all his stuff for one wedding. And it was incredible. Um, and then years later, unfortunately, um, I met an awesome guy here in San Antonio named Jim Landers. He is the hero of the photography community. <laughs> I'm sure you even know him, probably even met him. Yes, I, I do. He's such yeah. a great guy, uh, inside and out. And he helps the photography community with business strategies and education. He also teaches the art and the technical stuff, but he's known for his business, um, everything business. And he helps mm -hmm. photographers get sustainable and profitable and basically kicks their butt into gear into making the money they should be making. And he changed my life big time. And some of his students also helped me get to that point. So yeah, that's, he's been a big influence in yeah, other I don't know Jim personally, but uh, if you're anywhere even in the periphery of photography in San Antonio, <laughs> you've heard the name. Yeah, and the man everybody the that I know him. Yes, for <laughs> sure. Everybody that knows him respects him and appreciates him. Yeah. So, uh, and he's I've seen him compliment your work. Yeah, uh, that's an honor. <laughs> you know, online. So yeah, it's uh, it's huge. Uh, you know, did thinking about mentors for a minute? You said you wish you'd had more. Um, how does that how does that translate for you know people that are in leadership today how do, how how do we go out and find mentees or have, have you given that any thought man leaders of all kinds need mentors uh it's kind of extreme maybe but christian cults happen because people don't have appropriate mentorship <laughs> hmm. they go way Good off point. left field get into crazy stuff because they didn't have anyone to go Psh what's the matter with you? No, that's not what this means. Like, you know, we need people above us to keep us in line and they need people above them to keep them in line. And eventually the top, you know, apostles, or whatever, business leaders, they keep each other in line and, and, and encourage each other and are friends with each other. Cause that's what you need. Sometimes it's just a normal friend. So yeah, leaders really need mentors uh, at different levels to teach them, to show them what's going on and to kind of help them not get burned out and, and not give up. It's been my experience that uh, I've had two types of mentors in my life and actually had the pleasure of, of interviewing uh, maybe two of them so far on the podcast. One of them was, was the type where got very little interaction with him, but he made play sure I was in the right place at the right time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and cleared a path for me and, uh, and, and really in, even though it seems like a small contribution, because of some of 
making sure I was in the right place at the right time had a huge impact on my career and, and my life overall. Cool. Uh, and then there's the mentors you get to spend a lot of time with. Yeah. And I think the world's really um, hungry for those types of mentors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But finding them, um, there's no equation I don't that I know of <laughs> to find mm -hmm. that perfect mentor. You know, God brings them into your life. Wise choices help you find them. Um, being in the right community as already will help you find, you know, people that are in line with your, your goals and your visions. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also bad mentors for you. <laughs> uh, you have to be careful. They may have a totally different worldview. They may have a very mm -hmm. different business understanding of what business is. And, you know, they may not be leading you down the path that you need to be following. So you have to yeah, choose wisely point. who you let influence you and um, look at their fruit, look at their life, you know, have a relationship with them and don't just jump in. Um, they, be, they just should have something to prove their value as a, an authority in your life. Yeah. And I, I think that goes with any relationship really yeah. is, you know, kind of slow go is often the best. It's changing subject on you a little bit. Um, mm. There's risk involved in looking for a mentor. Uh, there's risk involved in being in business. How how have you how have you mitigated risk? I'm sure, especially in the creative world, and we'll get into uh, some other other uh, aspects of that. But what's uh, what's some of the risk you faced, or how did you navigate those? Any advice for that? Yeah, there's a lot of risk being self-employed <laughs> in an art career. Just those two things together is like insult to injury or I don't know if that's the right metaphor, <laughs> but, uh, when you combine those two things, it's dangerous. And so there's a lot of risk. You're relying on people to value something that's abstract and subjective to provide for your livelihood. And I have five mm. kids. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, Ooh, am I going to pay rent this month? I got to hustle and I got to network and do all the things I got to do. So yeah, there's, there's a, an amount of risk every week for me. But like some of the big risks I've taken, some of them I've been in, one was an investment in buying a second camera. I already had a nice uh, camera that I bought in 2019. And then I bought another of so the same one, I think two years later, because I realized I was growing and I needed a second identical camera for video production reasons, mm. multi, mm -hmm. multi, multi camera type productions. And, um, and it was scary because that camera was 2,500 bucks, <laughs> just the camera. And then sure. I had to buy, you know, a few other accessories for it. So that was one like financial risk. Um, business risks uh, for me yeah, was. $2,500 buys a lot of shoes for kids. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and meals. Yeah. Yeah. So and, much groceries. food. Yeah. yeah. Not as much as you think, but it's relatively right. a lot. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's like five weeks of groceries for me. <laughs> just nice. about. Um so, uh, oh yeah, I, I changed my business model, um, because of Jim Landers, he helped me see a bigger picture of what I could do with my time mm -hmm. and my skill. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, God gives us talents literal and he gives us talents monetarily and he gives us time to use. And so we have those, those time, talent, and treasure that we need to invest wisely. We could also waste them and squander them too. And so my talent as a photographer is pretty unique. You know, I try not to be prideful. I never put other photographers down, but there's not a lot of photographers like me that do what I do in Texas or yeah, I can attest to that central Texas. I'll say, because I know the central Texas community pretty well. And, um, so I'm like, I have something unique and I want to like make the most out of it. And I want to work it, invest it to provide for my family. Mm -hmm. Um, so he helped me with business model, um, and pricing strategies and sales techniques, which I had none of. Um, it's a lot of psychology. It's a lot of self-esteem and self-worth situations. Mint is a mind battle of the mind. Wasn't there a book about the name yeah, that years yeah, ago? There is. It is a battle of the mind. Um, selling your own, selling yourself, basically, you know, selling your time and your your um your skills. So that was scary. And it was like this hill that took me like a year, a year and a half to get over. And a friend of mine, Brandy Morgan, who was a student of Jim Landers, she was like an outside. You know how you can talk to your sibling different than you can talk to your parent? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really mm -hmm. weird. It's sort of like that. Very vaguely, I guess. I, I Brandy, Brandy was a, a, a driving factor that helped me see that this business model is not just Jim Landers' thing that he teaches. It's it's a thing that works for her, for Brandy, and many other photographers. Um, so, yeah, I was like, okay, she's a confirming factor that Jim Landers' stuff works, right? That's kind of mm -hmm. full, mm -hmm. full circle. Sorry, this dog is going crazy for 
Oh my gosh. He's got the zoomies. Um, and yeah, so that, that's, that's how that happened. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you talked about taking risks, changing your business model, um, really, uh, diversifying in some ways mm -hmm. and, and maybe you can unpack that in here in a minute, but, uh, there's always, as you do those things, there's always risk for, you know, mental health crisis, burnout, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, those kinds of things. How, how do you, what's your, what's your personal routines or secrets or thoughts on avoiding that kind of stuff or, or feeding yourself? Uh, yeah. It's really important that you don't get stuck in the various ruts that will lead you into burnout because there's a lot of them and you don't know what they are until you, you get there and it's not pretty. Um, I, it's sort of weird for me because, and I, I feel like this might almost be borderline unhealthy, but because I love my work so much, it almost is the refreshing thing for me, probably because my work involves so much variety. Mm. Um, you know, I don't just do one category. I do pretty much everything, but, uh, how do I word this appropriately? <laughs> uh, <laughs> adult related photography portraits. I don't do that. I don't do a boudoir or anything suggestive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but other than that, I do pretty much everything. Headshots, product photography, weddings. I do video as well. I'm diversified in that world. So the variety of my work itself keeps me from burnout for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, I do have some non-photography things that are still creative and fun for me. I do 3D design. Um, I use an incredible free program called Blender. And it is just awesome. It's free, but it can do almost Hollywood level stuff. So just playing in Blender and learning that. And, uh, and that is, that's actually a side hustle of mine is, is Blender assets and tutorials. So that's mm -hmm. another of my jobs, but it's so fun and it's refreshing and it's different than photography. So um, I enjoy that on the side. Sometimes I'll have a really stressful, busy week or month of photography stuff. And I will, like stop one night or a few nights a month and I will just do blender for hours. And that like hmm. gets that on my system and it's like, okay, that was fun. Made some cool stuff. Let's get back to editing photos or video. <laughs> so yeah, for me it's, and I'm a creative, so I have creative hobbies like blender mm -hmm. and um, some other things that, you know, do that for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. What about, uh, you know, some people, play music or they'll, mm. you know, go for a hike up the side of the mountain, yeah. any of those kinds of things, or you find all your energy just being in creative. Yeah. It's pretty much all in creative stuff. Um, I don't have a lot of time or luxury to go and do walks and hikes and trips and vacations. Cause I have five kids, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and doing those things with them is not necessarily recharging. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. I love them, yeah. but it's yeah. a production. Take going, some energy. Sure going to the store and then one other place after that, you got to plan all this stuff. So yeah, um, that would be great. I would like to do that, but I, I haven't. <laughs> well, those days, those days will come. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you, season. Triggered a, you triggered a thought there. How do you, especially being a creative, I suspect you have, uh, I'm thinking of weddings, for mm -hmm. example, you probably have a lot of opportunity to pivot. Have you found, have you found good ways to, kind of go with the flow and, and you know, keep the customer service high. Yeah. Um, I always put them first and I'm trying to accommodate each client because each client is very different. Um, so early on in the meeting stage, uh, we kind of are planning their session and I try to get a feel for who they are, what they're all about. And I work that into the photos. Um, and, uh, and that helps them. They appreciate that. And it makes the photos better. And they, they remember they remember my service because it was very personalized to them. I don't have an equation. I, I am a no cookie cutter photographer. Um, I don't believe in cookie cutter equations. So maybe for sales campaigns and behind the stuff, behind the scenes mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. But when it comes to being creative, uh, for me, every, every session is a little different. And um, my clients never forget that. And they, they always leave, they leave, when they leave reviews, it always comes up naturally that I listened to them, that I did what they wanted, that I found new ideas that they never thought of that end up lining up with what they want and they just didn't know it yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that helps set me apart too. What about, yeah. What about when you're, you're actually on site for a wedding and, uh, you know, things start to go wrong or go haywire. Uh, I've been, been around a lot of weddings, uh, don't necessarily need to go in, into all that. Uh, but my family's around a lot of weddings and usually the photographer, if they don't have a, if they don't have a wedding coordinator that they've hired, 
you kind of end up being that guy, right? It's, it's between you, the pastor and the DJ yeah. are the three people that kind of run the day. Uh, how, how do you, how do you get everybody on the same page? You know, the other folks there that, you know, the DJs and the, uh, the other vendors that are on site, you know, providing food, how do you deal with those stressful situations? Um, when a bride has a coordinator, that alleviates a lot of those scary situations. <laughs> when they don't, it's interesting. Um, you can tell things are thrown together and they didn't think it all the way through. So I have kind of become um, an, uh, an, an in-disguise wedding coordinator because I know so much about weddings. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been doing weddings for 18 years and I started, my first wedding was wow. I was still in high school, which is crazy. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> hiring me <laughs> it was actually a graduate friend of mine I was, she was one year ahead of me but um yeah. well they were thinking hey there's a guy that's got a camera and he's not going to charge us an arm and a leg yeah exactly yeah <laughs> um so but how do i alleviate like stressful situations communication is really key um i like to ask my brides who are your vendors up ahead of time and especially the photographer that's really who i care the most about if oh sorry if i'm video i'll contact the photographer um if i'm photographer and they have a video i'm definitely going to contact that video person and get on the same page so we have realistic expectations and you know we have some plan to how we're going to work together um but timeline is also really big having a detailed timeline for the day of and when it comes to photo sessions like a family shoot or a, a creative shoot um sometimes i'll even sketch out poses ahead of time so i know mm -hmm. What's going to be, they'll know as well that I can show them like, here, we're doing pose number three on this little sketched, you know, figure drawing mm -hmm, I did. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that helps so much. Um, planning is really key for success in many ways. <laughs> I'm sure you've had this experience where you showed up to a, a venue or especially church and the church says, oh, we don't allow, you know, cameras that make noise or we don't oh, we man. don't allow you to move during the ceremony or we don't allow electronic cameras because they're not holy yeah that <laughs> that's happened a lot ironically a methodist church had the most rules out of all the churches i've shot really yeah they wouldn't allow me to be on the ground floor during the ceremony they had a, a choir loft 200 feet in the back and wow. i you know i've been a pastor i'm pretty decent with my theology so i just said why is that she said well this is a sacred moment <laughs> like okay me and my sinful camera can't be down here during the sacred moment all right whatever <laughs> i'll get my zoom i'll rent a zoom lens and charge the bride for that um yeah, yeah so there is use some constrictions with church venues mostly um that's really yeah. the only situations i've been how, in how do you communicate you and i know you're a good communicator because i've experienced it um but how do you communicate with your bride in that situation? It's her day. Uh, you get to the venue. All of a sudden, they they pull out some rules that maybe you they didn't disclose previously, or you know, um, how do you? What have you found is the best way to to communicate that with your bride? Uh, is send a send a letter, send a pigeon face to face. Are, you know, are what's, we talking about what's your things... demeanor? Are we talking about before the wedding or at the wedding when surprises happen? Uh, let's <laughs> let's talk about both. <laughs> oh man, um, beforehand is where you try to cut the nip the, nip it in the bud, as the saying accurately says. Um, and that's the guy comes back to communication, being really clear, like, hey, this is what I'm delivering. This, I'm not delivering this and this. I'm not going to retouch every single portrait of you and remove your tattoos you shouldn't have gotten 10 years ago. Like, <laughs> you got to be detailed. And the contract comes into play there. The contract says what I'm doing and what I'm not doing. And mm -hmm. it, there's a few clauses in there on my contract that says there's extra fees involved if you want extensive retouching or if you want mm -hmm. re-edits or if you, you know, want to add an extra hour, this is how much it is. And uh, you get one of the most stressful days and supposed to be most <laughs> joyous days of the bride and groom's life. How have you found that like you um, de-escalate the situation or, or it's body language, tone, words, like what, what's kind of your secret sauce? Yeah, definitely being calm and collected. If you show that you don't know the solution yet in parentheses, then they're going to see that and they're going to freak out more. And they're going to regret hiring you because you don't know what to do. So I think it's just being calm and creative in this sense, because I have to find creative solutions to things like if the wedding's running late, you know, and that's the, that's the easiest problem. You just wait around and you can't do anything. But I've had situations where lighting is terrible. Um, for, for some reason, a bride planned her ceremony after sunset outside. <laughs> 
I I don't know why we told her not to, and she did it anyway. Um, Yeah, so just problem solving, being calm, and um, if something is just physically and scientifically and creatively is not possible, just telling your client in in the simplest way possible that, hey, I'm not able to do this because X, Y, Z, but let's try this, or we can do this instead. (laughs) Great. And, and, you know, as I, I said a moment ago, um, you get great reviews, but yet you've got these contracts that are, are very clear, you know, and, mm-hmm. and this is what I will do and what I won't do. How do you, how do you honor the contract, but yet, um, kind of hold your people to the contract, but yet get such great reviews and they love you when it's all over. Yeah. Well, the contract has never really been an issue, I think because it's simple. My my contract's only like two and a half pages, so I think it's pretty short. Um, so things are very simple. And when they read that, I think most people understand it pretty well. And then they get the idea like, okay, these are the rules. Like Daniel Grove can use the photos for this. I can use them for that. I can't do this. I can't do that. You know, if they don't like those, then they don't hire me. But I haven't really encountered that. Um, I think there's a level of trust when someone finds a great photographer and they love their work. They, they trust them and mm-hmm. they don't, you know, if they don't, then they're just not my, the client for me. <laughs> How do you, yes, yeah, sorry. How do you um, handle feedback and criticism, right? We, yeah. we all deal with that. You probably get mm-hmm. uh, more than your fair share of that sometimes. Yeah. How do you, how do you process that? Yeah. Criticism is a part of growing, especially in the photography world. We call it CC, constructive criticism. And um, it's funny, there's always some guy on a Facebook group that will give unsolicited or undesired CC on every photo he sees. Like, this is too bad. This is dark, whatever. And it's like, no one asks for that. But it's good to ask for it. You should ask for CC of your work. And um, that's that's helped me grow. Um, and uh, how do I how do I process that? You know, I have to accept their accept their criticism and try to see where they're coming from. Cause I've gotten bad. I've gotten cr- criticism that was not constructive that I, when I thought it through, I actually didn't agree with it because you can offer some people can offer bad advice. Not all advice is good advice and sifting through that and gleaning what you can out of it is a very valuable <laughs> trait that mm-hmm. takes a few offenses to learn. <laughs> um, it's a nightmare when new photographers jump on the scene. And they're like, look at my cool new photo. And everyone just blasts it to pieces. I feel so bad mm. for them. That's not mm. right. People shouldn't be doing that. That's not constructive. That's destructive criticism. Um, bless their heart. But that alone will make people want to quit if they don't have tough skin. So you do have mm-hmm. to have tough skin. But you also have to have some sense of, hey, I think I can see what this person is seeing. Because art is so subjective, right? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And so everyone mm-hmm. sees stuff totally differently. And, you know, I've looked at photos that I totally misinterpreted and I thought it was going, I thought it was funny. And I like laughed about a photo and he's like, what are you laughing about? I was like, I thought this was like satire. I thought this was supposed to be a funny photo and it wasn't. (laughs) Oh no. I I felt awful. And then we sort of, we went back and forth. It got a little heated on his end. And I think I asked, they deescalated him by just calmly explaining my thought process of how I was interpreting it as a comical thing. And he he didn't attend that. I, Mm -hmm. yeah, I missed it. Um, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I learned. I, I made a big mistake last year. I was uh, where I where I office has a lot of artwork in the hallways, and oh a lot boy. of local artists have contributed. <laughs> and we, one of our first artists that came out, thankfully they're still around, and, and we've got a. I hope I believe we've got a good relationship. I, I hope they feel the same. But um, uh, they they were showing. Uh, we were standing in the hallway and. And I was meeting them for the first time and, and the curator was, the art curator was saying, yeah, they have these other pieces that they're going to bring in, show them that one piece and that you're so proud of. Well, there was several pieces that was super cool mm-hmm. and, and showing me on the phone and flips to this one piece and, you know, turns it around. And I was like, oh, wow. Um, uh, how, how old is this lady? Cause and and she gets this just really upset look oh. expression on her on her face and says, "That's my eight year old granddaughter." And I was like, "Oh, what? I honestly thought that was an eighty year old lady." 
that I'm looking at this portrait of, you know, <laughs> and uh, it, it was her eight year old. Oh my gosh, what a trip! Wow, okay, <laughs> so I'm a lot more careful now as I walk the hallways. <laughs> foot in mouth, insert foot yes. into mouth. Like, what, what are you trying to, like, you, you know, what are you, what are you trying to express in this piece of art here? Help yeah. me understand where you were, <laughs> art where you is were weird like you that. were creating it. <laughs> art is weird like that, but also artists are weird. I think I'm. Not weird in the in the I'm 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 not weird in in the normal way that a lot of artists are just strange people, uh, and that makes it hard to understand them sometimes. And something they could be totally passionate about and all behind, you just don't get it, and that's okay. That's the nature yeah. of art. <laughs> yeah, you gotta gotta uh, enjoy it. Speaking of speaking of art, uh, where do you get your creativity and your your innovation? You are quite innovative compared to most photographers. Uh, you do a lot of what you do. Uh, in the digital space, you know, mm. post photography. Yeah. Um, and I guess just pause for a moment. Uh, there may be a lot of folks on the listening in, and I would say the majority don't actually know what it is you do. Describe, mm. describe kind of uh, some of the, some of the more fun stuff you do. Sure. So I like to term my specialty. I like to call it creative portraiture. It's like as vague as I can make it because within that, there's a lot of things. There's cosplay, which is costume play. So that short's for. So a cosplay photo shoot would be me photographing someone dressed up as a specific movie, anime, superhero character, book character, whatever that is. They have an usually an elaborate, well-made costume with props and makeup and hair and wigs, all, all the stuff to transform them into this character that they love. Uh, so that would be cosplay. And I do a lot of that at Comic Cons and throughout the year. But other stuff within that creative portrait world would include a themed photo shoot, which I do plenty with you guys. We've done a Renaissance mm -hmm. themed shoot. You know, y'all weren't any particular character in history or fiction. It was just Renaissance themed. I think y'all picked like a, a 200 year span of fashion and stuck to that as best you could. <laughs> y'all did great. Y'all looked fabulous. Um, yeah. We did Wild West. That's another fun theme to explore. We did Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I was a little more specific. Um, That's what started so it all. That was the first one, 2015, when um, and there Force was kind of the Casablanca out. kind of yeah, noir. theme. Yeah, that yeah. was fun. So themes yeah. are fun in a different way because they're not specific. You can explore. You can make up your own story. You can make up your own setting and character and look. You don't have to, you know, look at this magazine or ma comic book or movie like, oh, they had this color, you know, top, and it looks like this. It doesn't matter what you wear as long as you're within some theme or style. Um, you know, like this hippie. 70s could be a theme an 80s photo shoot i've done those um so themes are fun because they're a little more open-ended or less strict and there's more room for creativity um and uh and i like those i like doing theme shoots because they're they're different you know you don't do them all the time well i'm doing mm -hmm. them more often than most uh because um because that's my specialty but um in some of these photos i get the uh pleasure of using special effects to enhance the photo to a level that it didn't have before so for example i did a photo of you guys when your western shoot um a, a group photo of y'all look like y'all are walking towards the camera very much like a movie poster and y'all mm -hmm. had your guns in hand just awesome western outfits and uh y'all were in a parking lot during the original photo yes. But yes. I wanted y'all to be in the Wild West. So I found some really great stock photos of the Colorado, the, the Rocky Mountain mountain range. And then I found some ground photos of like a dusty country road and um, some other elements. I think I added a bunch of dust and, you know, flying in the air. So mm -hmm. I put y'all into a new world that y'all did not exist in and that is impossible to find. I don't, I mean, you can't compare those two photos are from different places. So it doesn't exist anywhere in the real world together. Yeah. And that's really fun because I can take my clients to other worlds and in fantasy, I can create sets and backgrounds that I either we can't afford or that could never, ever be made. Um, mm -hmm. which is uh, when I'm doing more sci-fi and fantasy, wild fantasy stuff that there literally isn't that in the real world to go shoot at, no matter what your budget is, we couldn't travel and find this, you know, whatever the background is. So being mm -hmm. able to make backgrounds from scratch is, a, is like my superpower for a lack of better terms. Um, yeah. I, I mentioned it earlier, but I do 3d design. And so that hobby, just nerdy hobby plays into my photography in some really cool ways where I can make full 3d sets and backgrounds, just like a set designer would make a, a movie set or TV set, mm -hmm. I can make that in 3D and usually from scratch or using some pre-made um, objects and textures, which saves time. 
And uh, yeah, so I can make custom stuff. You know, I have someone come to me like, hey, there's this character. And I look at, you know, the example images online from the anime or whatever. And it's like wild backgrounds that don't exist. I'm like, I got this. I can build that. <laughs> and yeah. I will put you in that world. And that's what sets my work apart. I like to say that I don't take pictures of people in costumes. I take pictures of people as that character in that world that they would have been in if they were real. And, um, mm -hmm. and I, and sometimes that's just a real location. I do have real locations. I don't do fake backgrounds in all my photos. Actually a few of them I do, but majority of my photos have real locations and I try to match mm -hmm. those to whatever the character or world is. Um, and we've done a pretty good job with you guys with that. And with my cosplay customers, uh, when they mm -hmm. present who they want to be, I'll start brainstorming like, okay, this character is a, a fantasy show so i've got like five or six forested areas i've got like one or two with a, a creek you know some with some really grassy plains like which one fits best we'll go with that and so i try to use mm -hmm. locations that are real because those of course are the best um yeah. i don't know how or, to spend five or hours the two, like you've done with yeah like you've done with us mm -hmm. uh, like you mentioned that western where you took part of the colorado rockies and the dusty road <laughs> and took us out of the parking lot and put us in <laughs> the United States in a place that doesn't exist. Yeah. And uh, I have shown that picture to uh, people of all walks of life, of all ages, of all experiences, and not one yet has figured <laughs> out that that's not a real photo. Yes. High praise. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, only a few of my <laughs> photographer friends, I think, I, I can tell at first glance, like, hey, this is a good composite. Like, composite is, is a composed mm -hmm. photo right multiple mm -hmm. fake layers together um but yeah it's a pretty pretty good one it sells the reality illusion pretty well i think and um mm -hmm. that's always my goal of course well and then the the on-site shoots that we've done uh the one western shoot you found us mm -hmm. a place in the area that, oh, that was so cool you know, had some kind of uh realistic looking you know saloon mm -hmm. old wood kind of stuff in the background yeah uh, even the renaissance one you found that a place was great. that easy we were able to cheat a little bit using real <laughs> real world but yeah then with you work your magic and suddenly we're in another place uh, i had to erase a Texas. few power lines and erase a few power yeah. boxes but after that you're in a little western or a little country change, village change out some uh change out in the renaissance one change out some metal roofs for thatch roofs oh yeah uh, i forgot i did that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you did. Well, what's crazy about that one was Nathan and I, my son, we were actually in Costco when you sent his picture through <laughs> and uh, said, hey, you know, I'm almost done. What do you think? And I was like, looks great, but it's got this metal roof next to you, mm -hmm. uh, which probably didn't exist at the time. Yeah. Oops. And then there was like a, uh, like a water tank kind of in the distance behind him. Mm -hmm. And I said, if he could get rid of those two, this would be the perfect picture. Yeah. And we hadn't even walked out the door <laughs> and you've already sent it back with the thatch roof and the water, <laughs> water tanks disappeared. And I'm like, yes, that was impressive. You know, that was, I think like the second or third year we were with you. So, uh, -huh. uh but yeah, the, the magic that you work, cause you, you put in, you know, I didn't realize you've been shooting weddings 18 years. How long have you been shooting cosplay? Less. So I started that around 2014, I think, or, or 13, maybe. It was actually really thanks to Nate. Nate and I just, he had this crazy idea. Let's go to a Comic-Con. I was like, mm -hmm. I've never been. I don't know what it's like there. I'll bring my camera. Maybe I'll get something cool. I don't know. <laughs> Little did I know, I found this whole new genre that became my thing. Yeah, um, and actually, it's probably what you're known for, right? If yeah, it is. Anybody and that I, knows you is. I have to, when it's appropriate, I, I have to insert that I, I do other things too. I wrote one of my <laughs> friends, this this kind of hurt my feelings almost. Um, many years ago, uh, I wrote one of my high school friends, you know, we were way out of high school still. And I realized like, hey, if you ever want to do um, a branding shoot, because she's like this boss babe, you know, doing businesses. I was like, if you ever want to do a branding shoot, let me know. She's like, yeah, if I ever want to do something with lightsabers, I'll let you know. I was like, oh. <laughs> I, I have been doing other stuff for years. Like surely you've seen, I don't just do lightsabers, whatever. So yeah. yeah, that's great. But you, you build great lightsabers in your 3d I do. software. Yes. That's super, super cool. I, I have to brag about this one and I'm going to give a shout out to the business. Um, Crimson Dawn Sabres. They're actually here in Texas. They're in Montgomery, Texas. Uh, Eugene is the owner. He's an awesome guy. I had him on Nate and I's podcast many years ago. And he makes custom and replica lightsabers, really good quality. These are like combat, RGB, sound, motion, everything. And wow. we connected because he saw some of my 3D designs of lightsaber hilts that I'd just done for fun because I love lightsabers. 
And so I ended up designing one for him and it's actually in production. Like you can buy Sweet. the lightsaber that I made from scratch in 3D on his website. It's called the Invictus Saber and nice. it's beautiful. I'm pretty proud of it because it is really cool. But um, yeah, I've always loved lightsabers for various reasons. And now I have one. I actually have it in my, I should have got it out. It's in my closet over are there. You, are you able to say any royalties attached to that one? Or He, uh... he paid me for the design, but no, no, nice. no long-term royalties yet. Maybe in the future since... I think that one, I think that one sells pretty good. He's, he's bragged about it online and at con. Good. So maybe that'll open up more doors in the future for something different. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe Hollywood will be calling you up. Going, yeah. Hey, we right. need some new sabers. Uh, Di- dream job. Disney's, yeah. Disney's like, uh, can you design, uh, the Mandalorians, uh, <laughs> the new saber for his show? Absolutely. So yeah, that'd be crazy. So, so any, uh, any places you go to get creativity or innovation? I mean, like, just dive deeper in your mind or yeah. you find stuff in the real world. I probably sound really conceited at this when I say this, but I, um, my imagination inspires me the most out of all things. Like I don't go looking on Instagram for ideas and I go and do them. I just start to like, look at back what I've done in the past. And I say, how can I one up myself mm-hmm. and find new things that I have thought of in my imagination that I haven't done yet. And I try to, I try to do those. So uh, instead of being my own worst critic, I'm kind of like my own work, my own best um, inspiration a little bit. But my imagination is very active. Uh, I'm sure you see my dream posts. I like to po- post on my, about, my, about my dreams on Facebook. So, you know, my mind is always, my gears are always turning with crazy ideas and stories. And uh, yeah, it just goes back to my childhood, I guess, being an artistic family and always watching sci-fi fantasy movies mostly. It helps a lot. So. How do you how do you wrestle with uh, I've met some creatives that kind of get lost in the art and the world of creativity and lose touch with reality, <laughs> um, you know, and almost to the point where it's a stereotypical. Oh, well, they're an artist, you know, mm-hmm. um, how do you you're you're a dad of five, um, you know, you got a household to run and care for. You've got uh, you got several gigs going all at the same time. How do you how do you engage kind of those responsibilities, um, you know, but yet still maintain the creative? Yeah, well, when you have to work your butt off just to pay your bills every month, it kind of keeps you grounded. <laughs> and if I made more money, maybe I'd be more at risk for that. I, I'm not sure. Hmm. Maybe I think of something different than what you're asking. But um, yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, beyond that yeah just i've met some people that say well i'm creative you know don't hold me to a deadline i'm creative don't hold me to Mm. you know certain output and you certainly uh break all of those paradigms you're you know you you turn things around you you turn them around yeah well and and faster than most of your competitors you know mm -hmm. maybe it's a business yeah, that's that's okay. That's what I was just thinking. It was was the business side balances my artistic side, and um, this is something that I'm very passionate about because now that I have been mentored by you know Jim and a few, some others, I, I mentor other photographers. And one thing that I'm really mm-hmm. big about, I want to open their eyes early on about this fact, is that artists are generally uh, terrible business people <laughs> mm-hmm. because they're great artists, and the better you are as an artist, almost the worse you are as a business owner and and salesman or money maker with your own art. Uh, there's a lot of psychology going on there, but I, and I'm not like this incredible business person, uh, but I I've learned things along the way and that helps me uh, a lot stick to being professional, being efficient and quick. Um, I can tell when things are kind of taking too long and I need to cut that short cause it's, it's sucking my energy and my time out of what, where I need to be. And I'm not meeting goals that I need to, because people are paying me money and expecting things. So that kind of, that keeps me from getting too lost. Talk, talk to, uh, you know, if, if a creative happens to tune into this podcast or if you reshare it and they get to this, this point of the episode, um, what are, what are some of your thoughts or your tips on, you know, how do they, how do they do what you've done? How do they, uh, if they're perfectionist or I, I've met artists like, I've got all these pieces that just aren't done yet. You know, mm-hmm. how long's that been? Uh, some of them have been sitting around for five or 10 years. How, hmm. how do you teach? Cause you're, you are mentoring. 
how do you teach that uh, to to get something across the finish line and and it's it's beautiful and it it's um, it's it's I don't want to say good enough. I'm I'm not sure. That's why I'm wrestling for a word here. But like to the bride, this is or to to my family. The work you do is amazing. Everybody that sees it, we literally have people say, "I can't." When is your what's your theme <laughs> for this year? When's your Christmas card coming out? Right. <laughs> uh, and and so it's created this thing where people are actually looking forward to receiving our Christmas card, and disappointed when we did. Uh, you know, our kid's wedding photo as a Christmas card because <laughs> <laughs> they're like, wait, what happened to the theme? You know, so, uh, but I'm sure you could look at it and go, oh, there was this, you know, one reflection I didn't get rid of, or there's <laughs> this, this place over in the corner that nobody on the planet had noticed, but you, mm-hmm. how do you, how do you that, teach that? Just let it go. <laughs> that uh, happened on y'all's uh, Harley Davidson photo. You remember? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's still it? noticed. Yeah, it's you and me and Nathan. <laughs> and we're Nathan. the only three that know. <laughs> um, now everybody that's got the Harley thing hanging on their yeah. fridge are going to go get Zoom a magnifying in. glass. Yeah. And... <laughs> that's funny. Um, let's see. I and not getting hung up in those details. It can be tricky if you're a perfectionist. Um, I don't know if I'm a perfectionist, but I am detail oriented. So I have a few passes I'll make over my photos where I zoom in around the edges, mostly to make sure that edging, you know, if I'm erasing backgrounds, make sure it's clean. So I have a few in my, things in my workflow that require me to pay attention to the close detail stuff. And then once I finish that part of my workflow, I move on and I do the hmm. bigger I mean, I zoom out you know, literally and do the bigger things or the, 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 the vague things like color, everything, add more contrast to everything. And I hit a certain stage where I'm like, I've been at this for about three, four days now. I should be done by now. And if there's more things I could do, they're not important enough. I didn't, I can't keep doing this. You know, I, I can't. And um, so how, my mind. How do you teach that or encourage that to the the people you're mentoring? Yeah. Um, it's just to keep your, keep your big, your big picture in mind. Is that, hey, you, you don't just have this one photo to deliver. You know, if, if they're doing detailed edits, you've got a whole session. And you've already been paid for that and you've already spent that money. So you got to move on with your life and get the next job. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Set, set goals and set timelines and give that client an expectation. Hey, it's going to be two more weeks for everything to be done, or it's going to be two more months before everything's done so that they're not grilling you and you don't have that weird pressure in the back of your head. Mm-hmm. So yeah, taking, having a, an efficient workflow is really important. Um, sticking to it and not letting yourself waste your life away, doing things that no one's going to notice and things that will not make you more money than you've already made. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, how, how often do you have, uh, seems like a lot of this is you, like your own self-control, your own management. Um, do you, do you, does your wife speak into your life and say, hey, buddy, you've been <laughs> locked up in there too many hours? Or how do you, how do you kind of find that work-life balance? As I almost hate to say work life balance, you got five kids. Yeah. You, you got several gigs going on, but how do you, how do you keep your priorities, your kids feeling loved, your wife feeling loved, mm-hmm. your customers feeling loved? How do you wrestle with that? Yeah. Is it, setting kind of work hours is one, is one way to do it. One of the biggest things you can do. So I used to, Anytime, let's say after my work hours should have been done, you know, after four or 5 PM and the kids are home from school, dinner was not made yet. There's kind of that, that in between, you know, hour or two of early evening. Um, I used to get on the, if my kids are occupied and my wife was occupied, I would go back to my computer and start editing. And I did that for a year or two or three. And then I think my wife has brought it up a few times and I started thinking, I was like, you're right. This is not healthy. Like I'm working too much and, um, I am taking away time with my kids that I'll never get back. So I realized I was working during family hours and that wasn't okay. So I stopped doing that. And now currently what I, what I kind of have to do to keep things rolling as of right now is I work during the day, um, which kids go to school. My, my oldest three are in school. And so I'm working usually about nine till like 12. Then there's like lunch and nap time. So that's a little bit of, you know, in indirect time with, with my wife and kids, because I'm putting them down, I'm having lunch with them. And then I work a little bit more from about like one to two o'clock. And then school pickup is after that. So 
there's that. And then I work at night <laughs> again. <laughs> um, and I, I try to after have they're all to bed. Yeah. After they go down, I do about an hour or two of editing and then an hour with my wife before we go to bed, we watch something, we talk about the next day plan, whatever. So, um, and, and that's a self-control thing. That's definitely a priority where like I could easily just edit my life away because I enjoy mm -hmm. it. Not that mm -hmm. I don't enjoy being my wife or my kids, but psychologically and being, you know, the man of the house, whatever, you gotta bring home the bacon. I'm like, I gotta keep working to keep the money flowing. If I, if I slow down, it's gonna slow down twice as fast and I'll be all dried up and before I know it, but that's fear and mm -hmm. that's not faith. And it's only, it's not believing that God will provide for me. It's also not believing that what I've done already is enough that I've, I haven't worked enough. You know, I have, I've been working my butt off solid for like years. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's kind of it is hours priorities, believing in, you know, if you, if you're a person of faith, you know, there's, they, we have that, that faith we can rely on that God's going to provide for us. Um, mm -hmm. especially when we're doing our part, you know, just sitting around being lazy, but I don't know if it's God, God's going to provide for you very much because you're not doing your part. Uh, yeah, no, there's that new Testament scripture works. at work or you don't eat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and faith without works, which means we yeah. believe and we do. Um, that's about spiritual things, but also about everyday, you know, mundane th human things too. So you got to believe that your work that you've been put in is, is, uh, is valuable. And also when you are in the midst of the working time, before you have to look back and say, I hope we worked enough earlier while you are working during that day, you have to make sure it's efficient and not being distracted mm -hmm. or wasting time because that's like good. I could easily be, you know, edit, edit, Facebook, 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 edit, edit, Facebook, 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 and my my hour my hours of work is really just halved or less because distractions and so that's something i struggle with right now is being is distractions so i'm mm -hmm. i'm trying to make my work hours more solid work and so that when i look back i don't worry that i didn't work enough today i was like oh i definitely got a lot done today so i'm fine i, I can take the night off and not edit at all at night because i know i i got deals booked i got stuff finished and now i can just have a whole night to, for my that's wife good. That's good. Yeah. And I'm getting closer uh, to that more often. Yeah. Two, two more places I want to go. One is uh, to the creative uh, that says, well, I can't just turn it on and turn it off. I, when I'm in the flow, I have to stay in the flow and work all mm. night. And, you know, I, I can't have a real job because, um, you know, it, it, it gets in the way of my flow. And, mm. uh, you know, obviously that's, you do amazing work. Everybody at Seizure Work loves it. Thank you. Uh, but yet you're finding, it sounds like you can turn it on and off. Is So what is, are you the exception or is that just an, an excuse or what are your, what are your thoughts? I'm not sure yet. Um, I write a lot of lists, so that helps me. I can stop in the creative flow because I made a list of things I'm going to do next or ideas I've had. In the middle of not being creative, I'll have ideas because the creativity is always there in the background and mm -hmm. um, something will pop up and uh, I'll have an idea for an awesome YouTube video or a funny reel that I want to make. And while I'm grocery shopping or something in the middle of family time, so I'll write it on my list. I use, now I use OneNote. I use an Evernote junkie for years until Evernote sold out and got all about the money and mm. started throttling everything. So I jumped ship and changed to OneNote. So now I have a ridiculous amount of notes and inspiration uh, text files and lists uh, that I store all my creative stuff so that it's never lost. Because mm -hmm. I am an absent-minded professor. Like as smart as I like to think I am, I'm also super dumb a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just mess things up really good by overthinking and triple, quadruple, pentuple guessing myself. So uh, writing things down in lists helps me a lot so I don't forget detailed stuff and let, I don't let things slip through the cracks. I have a list of leads that have contacted me in the week. I have a list of upcoming YouTube videos and even scripts that I'll write down, bullet points, anything. Um, it's all there. That helps me Great. a lot. That's that's very practical. Thank you for yeah. that. And then uh, just before I let you go, spend time with your family. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, thank you for for giving up some of that valuable time no. for this. Uh, totally spend worth it. time with me. But um, AI, give me give me a two to two minute thoughts on where's AI going for the creative? <laughs> are you embracing it? Are you against it? What mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, man, I'm I'm right in the middle. Like. I think it's really cool and, and intriguing and inspiring. Um, I've been meaning to do some YouTube tutorials where I make a 3D scene, 
based off of an AI render that I, you know, a prompt that you can type in in a few seconds, mm -hmm. um, mostly for educational purposes. Um, when I find these accounts that are blowing up because they're only posting AI prompts that they made in 10 seconds or a minute, I'm like, you're not an artist. <laughs> the stuff you post is cool. I'm like I love AI art. Some AI sci-fi art is incredible. Very, yeah. very interesting and unique. But where is that all coming from? It's coming from stolen artwork from other humans. <laughs> mm -hmm. Most of them without consent, or, you know, without mm -hmm. royalties or thanks or attribution. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's just garnered. It's just profiting off of human art that's been there for years mm -hmm. hundreds of years and um and it looks cool and awesome and new and really it's just kind of rehashing what we've already done so it's to me it's not true artificial intelligence I, i'm a sci-fi nerd so i have a few thoughts about artificial intelligence that go beyond this discussion yeah. um in neural you know it's networks machine learning it's just a really clever algorithm set based mm -hmm. off of what we've trained it to do so yeah, I've, I've used uh, text AI stuff a few times to like come up with an ad text just to see how well it turned out and um, have some fun with that. Um, the AI generative fill in Photoshop is really cool. Basically you can select an area and you can generate extra background that didn't exist. You can hmm. create objects that, that, that weren't there. Um, I, I brought my kids when I finally got that update in Photoshop, I was like, Hey kids, come here, come here. So I had a picture of a couple with a motorcycle. It was like an engagement shoot. And I said, all right, you tell me something to add to this photo. And these, and they're like, what? I go, just tell me something you want to see in the photo added. And they're like a cat. So I selected an area and said, add a cat. And boom, within like a few seconds, a pretty realistic looking with accurate lighting and coloring cat was in the photo. And then you, wow. know, you, a dragon. I was like, okay, this guy, a dragon. <laughs> and it was so fun. The kids loved it. So that kind of stuff is, is fun for kicks and giggles. Um, but uh, it, it is, it comes in practical. I recently had a shoot with gym, a gym, gymnast photo shoots with like 80 kids. And my backdrop was not big enough. It, it was not wide enough for what we were doing on the, on the balance beam. And so I had to use AI generative fill on about 500 pictures to fill in the gaps where the background ended. And it worked like 90% of the time. And that was wow. incredible. Yeah. So not going to totally diss on it because it's awesome for those kind of filler jobs you have to do sometimes that manually. So, is so you really think you could bad. take our original Star Wars photo in the field and add some TIE fighters off in the distance? Oh, yeah, totally. In? It would be so. Be, it would be super easy for that to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd yeah. be kind of fun. Do that. Do a t t tutorial on that. Mm -hmm. That'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. and you know, it, maybe maybe a couple of walkers, you know, coming yeah. toward us. You know, so now even if I did that though, then I start zooming in and noticing the little artifacts that really <laughs> trigger me. I'm like, oh, that perspective is. What was it doing? You know, it's not perfect. I probably, I, it probably yeah. will be in a few years. It will be indistinguishable yeah. from reality. I think in at least five years, minimum, yeah. max. Does, does that excite but, you, or does that does that kind <laughs> of piss you off in some ways? Yeah, both, because <laughs> I yeah. want to use it to make my job easier, but then yeah. everyone else is going to use it to do what Daniel Grove did five years ago, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a fraction of the time. So I don't know. I'm like that with a lot of things. I, I don't make up my mind because I see both sides of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, though, is you seem like the kind of guy uh, will tend to embrace it and push the envelope, uh, yeah. which is which is always going to keep you in the forefront. Mm hmm. Yeah, innovate with it. Because you got to change with times. You know, when the digital camera came out in the late 90s, I'm sure people dissed on that. Like, oh, that'll never take on. Or that's going to steal all our jobs. Well, you know, mm -hmm. 20 years later, they're digital. And now uh, I'm sure AI cameras are coming soon, too, that'll do all that kinds of stuff for you. And that's mm -hmm. going to be a big upheaval. Like, oh, you know, you're not a real photographer. Use one of the AI cameras. You know, I have to change my settings myself. And <laughs> that's how technology goes, right? Well, that's, that's like... Uh artists that used to give Ansel Adams a hard time because art photography wasn't real art. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I had to paint my landscapes, you know, it took me five weeks. <laughs> you just pushed a button. <laughs> yeah. Until you figure out all the math and all the chemicals and the hours yeah. he slaved over yes. making that one print. Art is always evolving. So, you just got to flow with it and use it as a tool for communication. That's yeah, what it is. Yeah. Well, Daniel, you have, uh, You've blessed my family with your, your <laughs> art wizardry and your, your mastery of all things, uh, photography and, and photo, uh, and, and just, uh, you're a fun guy to be around. Thanks. And, you too. <laughs> and so we, we love having you, uh, be part of our hopefully annual tradition for years to come. So, yeah. 
uh, we we'll, we'll be in touch soon about what our thoughts are for this year's card. Ooh. For those of you <laughs> listening and watching, sorry, you have to wait till December. Yeah. Uh, so, a non-disclosure right, buddy, agreement. Well, <laughs> yeah. NDA. Thank you so much uh, for, for hanging out with me for a little bit and uh, uh, we'll be in touch. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for this episode of a leader's journey podcast. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up and remember to subscribe to our channel.